Welcome everyone to this month's Intentional Success webinar. We're gonna talk about organizational structures for scalable growth. Scalable just rolls off our tongues now. We say it all the time, we say it about everything, but I'm gonna get down to the brass tacks of what it really means when it comes to having a scalable business, particularly in our post pandemic uh, society, business model, our channels have changed. What we're looking for in a successful business is changing as well. Now, we all know we've needed to evolve. You're going to have to evolve to stay in sync with what the marketplace is telling us we need to do. Um, but we're also going to um, evolve because we have learned things about our business models, our pre-pandemic business models that really aren't awesome. So how are we going to deal with that? And I'm going to talk about some of those things here today. Um, Always a few new folks on the call. Thank you for being here. I'm Tom Stimson. I'm, uh, I am the Stimson Group, uh, TR Stimson Associates, whatever you want to call me. I've been doing this. I've been consulting for 15 years. I've been in the business for 40 years. Um, I live with you guys every day. I have worked very hard the past 15 months uh, with my hands deep in the, in the bowels of your companies, um, helping you find solutions to get you through the pandemic and get you onto the next thing. It's added a lot of things to my toolbox. And I try and share those with you every month to help you get a little bit farther forward. And also to invite you to, if you're ready to come work with me and let me help you move faster. And that's what I do is I accelerate the process. I make it easier for you to get where you want to be much, much, much sooner. Um, time is money after all. So, this is being recorded because I heard the record thing start. Um, the replay will be up on my website later on today. You'll have access to that for a month. If you've got questions, please try and use the Q&A box. Um, introduce yourselves into the chat. You may have some new friends here. There's probably people here who can help you solve a problem right now. Um, find out who they are and get in touch with them after this webinar. Um, Great thing about being in the pandemic bubble is it's forced all of us to get out of our bubble and interact with new folks, build up a new network of people who can help us learn how to do things like streaming events and how to sell differently and find trucks when there are no trucks to rent. Um, great stuff going on out there with the networks. My quote of the month. After you've done the same thing, after you've done a thing the same way for two years, look over carefully. After five years, if you're doing the same thing, look at it with suspicion. And after 10 years, throw it away and start all over. I am still looking at processes that were state of the art, best practices 30 years ago when I started managing businesses in this space. Uh, my goodness, uh, we need to do something about that. So that's what these webinars are about. This is really what my practice is all about. So much of what I'm doing is undoing the conventional wisdom that I was taught, that you were taught. It made perfect sense. It looks great on paper, but the fact of the matter is it's never really worked for us. And we can make it a little bit better, but the awesome thing, the outcome, the there's always a silver lining, right? The benefit of the pandemic is that it completely exposed the flaws in our business models. And we have an opportunity to do something that's much, much, much better um, for our businesses, for our employees, for our clients, for our bottom line, our retirements, whatever it is that is value, valuable to you today, we have a better path ahead. So before I get there, before I dig into that, I'm gonna give you uh, my monthly update. Um, I could do an entire webinar on each one of these three bubbles in here, but I want to give you some quick lessons from 2020. Um, I did a keynote for, well, some of you were on it last week uh, for one of my, um, uh, my association uh, clients uh, where I talked about this in depth, some key lessons from 2020. If we've learned nothing about our businesses and ourselves in the past 15 months, there are three things that are super important which rise above everything else that we've ever talked about, including many of my webinars, people, cash, and self-care, okay? 
we've always said people were important, but we didn't always do the things that show that they were actually important. We didn't actually value people because we didn't value services. We put our emphasis on equipment and hardware and technology instead of the people who know how to implement it. Um, people in terms of the folks who support us, our families, our friends, um, all the things that we work for are people. Cash became really important. That became very obvious last spring when the pandemic hit. Um, yeah, you lost all your revenue, okay, but you lost all your cash and it became a cash management exercise. So I'm hoping we've got a much better understanding of how to manage cash after the lessons from last year. And I don't wanna lose the good habits that we picked up in building cash reserves. And then the, 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 the third thing, and I need this as much as anyone, is the self-care, is knowing that if we don't take care of ourselves, then our employees will not take care of themselves, um, which means that we're business is not going to get taken care of. We have to make time for ourselves. Many people like me who have been working from home um, for the past year have found out what we gave up was self-care because now we're we're at home 24 seven, we're working 24 seven, we're having to find time to go buy the groceries, or do something with the family, or, you know, even watch television after dinner, uh, because we're so close to the office, and there's always work to be done. So here's the thing I want you to take away. If, if you do not manage all three of these, and if you don't keep all three of these balls in the air, uh, the intersect is always going to be crisis management. If you're not doing self-care and you've got your people and cash dialed in, you're going to be in crisis management and it's going to be personal crises. If you don't have the cash solved, if you've got people and self-care solved, you're going to have cash crises all the time. Okay? And if you, don't if you haven't figured out that people are vital to our future and it's a very small group of very select people, that are the right people for your business. And if we haven't dialed that in, then we're gonna have people crises all the time, which is what a lot of you are facing right now. And I'll talk a lot more about that today. But if we can get all of these things right, you know, and that's the goal, you know, we gotta balance all of this, then we've got a way forward, not just get through the end of the pandemic and our labor shortages and our supply chain shortages that we're gonna talk more about today, but we're gonna have a sustainable business model that will grow with us and contract the next time we have to contract and there will be a next time, right? Um, we don't know what it's going to be. We don't know if it'll be another pandemic or whatever economic downturn there might be, but there will be another contraction. So are we gonna be better prepared for it next time? So my prediction is here for, well, basically the next nine months. Um, most of you are telling me you're getting very uneven demand through August. You've got some busy weeks. You got through graduation. Maybe it's dropped off. Um, some of you have a busy July for whatever reason, or maybe a busy August, but it's not that steady demand. And you're a little bit surprised by the things that you are being asked to do. You're asking me, do I hire my people back? No, wait as long as possible to bring in permanent work workers. And we're gonna talk about that more today. Um, if you need freelancers to get your work done, um, if you need subcontractors or suppliers of any kind to get your work done anytime in the measurable future, at least through the end of the year, hire them now, book them now, tie them up. Um, uh, your supply chain is going to be very, very busy and you need to tie that, those people up as quickly as you can. Now, September seems to be busy. Um, virtual and hybrids are in play. I'm hearing some all virtual meetings. I'm hearing some hybrid meetings. I'm hearing about the occasional in-person with, with little or no virtual. Um, major labor shortages ahead. Logistics costs are through the roof. Um, trying to get a truck out of the middle of the country to one of the coasts is nearly impossible to get that scheduled. Anything in more than a seven day window. Um, they're just not committing. There's too much demand and not enough trucks and drivers right now. So we have some problems right here on our horizon. Uh, Q4, we're going to see some peak capacity. It's not the kind of capacity that you used to have, but you're going to run out of people and stuff. All of your supply chain is going to run out and it's going to be very difficult to fulfill that one extra job that you think you can sell. 
Now, in all of this, you still want to keep your core team lean and involved in the acquisition planning, and but not necessarily the execution of jobs. We'll talk more about that today because that is a mindset shift that many of you are extremely resistant to, but I'm going to make my best case for it. So stay tuned for that. And like I said, fasten your seatbelts, right? Uh, 2022, it's going to be a seller's market at least for the first half of the year. Seller being you, it's your year. It's your chance to turn away business that is not ideal for your situation or that you can't make money at. So start thinking about how you're going to manage that because it is coming now. Um, Short-term challenges, I already talked about. We know there's a labor shortage. We hear about it on the news all the time. Um, you're going to have to change your mindset about bringing back staff and what it's going to take to bring them back. I will talk about more of that. Um, shortage of trucks and drivers, I just mentioned that. The manufacturing supply chain is broken. Anybody who does integration knows that you can't get the product that you sold that they guaranteed would be available for delivery, which is now nowhere in sight. Everything is backlogged. Um, it's pushing things um, downstream is making it difficult to get some work done. So some creative thinking about how we approach our clients, particularly the ones who want specific things about how are we going to support them. Uh, air travel, rental cars are almost non-existent. Whoever thought we would run out of rental cars, but the rental car chains got rid of all their cars <laughs> and they can't get new ones because, well, there's a supply chain problem in manufacturing and automobiles. So uh, we have all these short-term challenges, but they are short-term. They will not last forever. They are challenges, which means you can overcome them. Um, the question is, are you ready to do that? So I'll pause before I get into the webinar and just remind you, have you done the do-over that you meant to do this past year? And if you haven't, there's still time to talk about it. It's never too late to start moving in the right direction for your business, challenging some of your old assumptions, um, changing the mindset, or the head trash that we all have about our businesses. I'm happy to help bring you forward, talk to you about what it looks like. Just book a call. Uh, we'll talk about the things, no obligation. I can often, often give you a few tips that'll really help you out until you're ready to go a little bit deeper into it. So it's always worth the time for you and myself because I learned something if we just have that conversation. So owners, principals, reach out, let's chat. Let's see where you're at and where you wanna go. Now let's get into the whole webinar, scalable growth. So why this webinar? Um, I, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna start with a little bit of a story, the, 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 the crashed bicycle here. Uh, a dear, dear friend of my family's um, was severely hurt in a, a bicycle accident the other day. And, and, and I won't call her out. Um, she, was, she was doing what she loved, which was in a race. She was in a bicycle race. Um, she's been out of training for a while. This was her first major race again. Um, she, through whatever circumstances, took a spill at 35 miles an hour and flew through the air and hit a tree and is now in very, very bad shape. Um, that's, th there's a metaphor here, obviously, about business. We all want to get back to where we were in 2019 business was booming. We were writing a lot of business. We were cranking a lot of work out. We were keeping a lot of things going. We wanted that pace and we want to get back there. And I'm just, I just want to caution you. There's a really nasty wreck. If you try and go at the pace that you went before. Okay. You don't have the team anymore to do it. The processes have changed. The financial situation of how we make money in the business has changed. You're not ready to go fast. Just because you were great at selling ice cream doesn't mean that you're going to be great at selling something else, All right? So urgent growth, feeling that you have to grow urgently is a real dangerous place to start from. Feeling that you have to compete at the top level when you've been out of practice is very dangerous. Um, we need a new scalable model for growth that allows you to succeed along the way. So there's a lot of changes in our business models and that's what this webinar is about today. I want you to start getting your heads around that. You've heard most of this before. I'm gonna try and give it to you a little bit tighter package. Um, 
Thank you for the questions. Keep dropping questions in there. I see them. I'm going to answer them at the appropriate times. Good questions so far. Keep them coming. All right. Be smart and be strategic. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to say these things over and over again. In <laughs> this is the new normal. Sorry. <laughs> you knew it was going to be said. I have to say it. We're in the new normal or the next normal, whatever you want to call it. Um, We've got to be smart, but we have to be smart in a way that we weren't smart before. Very conservative on cash and debt. Uh, I, I've worked with hundreds of companies. I lost count after 300. I just quit counting. So many of them were overextended on debt. They had uh, debt on their balance sheet that exceeded their revenue on a given year. $4 million of debt for $4 million of revenue. Crazy, crazy stuff. Um, it's real easy to get somebody to lend you money, uh, particularly if you're buying new equipment. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can make the money it takes to make the payback. So don't overwork your tools. Don't overwork your debt tools. Don't overwork your asset tools and keep your cash free so that you can do what cash is supposed to do, which is fuel the business. Um, we've got to learn to speak buyer instead of seller. Uh, when our when our buying chain, when our customer channels changed this past year and our old buyers were all laid off and our new buyers came in, they spoke a different language. They didn't speak our language like our old buyers did. They spoke a different language and we kept talking to them in our stuff and they kept going, wait, that's not what I'm asking. Um, it's hard to grow your business if you're not in sync and in touch with your buyers. And teach, and, I, and trust me, because I work with so many of you on marketing and sales and writing proposals and conducting discovery meetings, learning how to shift from the old language of talking about how we do things and how cool it is to talking to listening to what the customer needs. It's a tough, tough change. Learning how to speak in buyer terms, which means listen in buyer terms, instead of getting excited and talking about the cool things that we can do that may or may not even solve the problem of the person sitting in front of me. There's a lot of business to be had out there if you can find the right connection between you and the ideal buyer. In our new normal, we're going to have to be very selective on which work we pursue. Your team is smaller, your resources are, have changed. Um, the channel is asking for different things. We're, we're still in the virtual world, probably will be forever. We're still working on platforms, which may or, we may or may not have control over. Um, you've got to be much more selective about the work you're willing to pursue because there is going to be more demand than there is supply. If you take whatever comes your way, you will, may not get the ideal work. You'll get the work that's in front of you. And you have the luxury of being a little bit more selective if you get your act together so that you're in a position to do it and lose some of the head trash about that fear-based selling that if I don't win this job, there's never going to be another job ever, ever again. So we've got to figure that out as well. And we have to be strategic, right? Of course we do. Whoever said, no, don't be strategic. That'd be a great book title though. Throw, throw strategy out, never do strategy again. Awesome. But be strategic. You've got a sales, operations, and finance. Business is a three-legged stool. That has not changed. You've got to keep the three legs in balance. You have to muster the fundamentals. I'm going to do a lot of martial arts metaphors here because gosh darn it, I am a martial artist, right? And all the things that I'm talking about today are the exact same things that we talk about in martial arts. You know, when we talk about, you know, uh, being smart, it's you have to read your opponent. You have to understand what they're going to do and how they're going to treat this engagement, whether you're sparring with them, doing self-defense, whatever it might be. Even as an instructor, when I'm training an individual, I have to understand how they're processing the information. Are they able to look in a mirror and see what I'm doing and translate it to their body? Or do I need to go over there and tactically, physically move them into the right position and let them memorize it that way? Okay. We have to think about all of these things. We have to change our styles to accommodate what we're dealing with. Okay. In martial arts, a black belt doesn't mean that you know everything. A black belt simply means that you've mastered some fundamentals, which gives you permission to learn something else. 
sales, operations, and finance are the fundamentals of business. We know how to, we have to know how to do math. We know how to, how, how to organize processes and we know, have to know how to engage and close business. These are the fundamentals. How do we take it to the next level, All right? Sustainable growth. Short-term growth doesn't help you, okay? It puts a strain on your system and maybe puts a little bit money in there, but it generally will set you back farther than it moves you forward. You know, it's that, it's that one step forward, two steps back. Sustainable growth. We're gonna add muscle in karate terms. We're gonna put muscle memory in there through learning. And then we're gonna repeat it over and over and over again. And a lot of martial arts is very, very repetitive because I want you to move the exact way, you know, the karate kid, wax on, wax off, okay? I want you to instinctively throw a wax off when you have a, an attack coming in this way. This is muscle memory. If we can do these things automatically in business, then we're going to be able to grow more sustainably. Okay? We have to learn the fundamentals. Then you can introduce your skills and talents. Okay? Um, uh, my, my talent happens to be uh, defense. I'm a good defensive fighter. I'm not a very good offensive fire, fighter. So I add skills that, that augment my God-given talent to fight defensively and fight reactively and block and counter. Punching above your weight, which means you get into a class where you're, you have to be a little bit outclassed a little sometimes, sometimes means that you're going to learn something. If you never punch above your weight, if you never take on a project that's bigger than you are or a little bit more challenging, you will not learn. But there's too much of a good thing. They taught us... Um, when I got my black belt, a lot more learning happens after you get your black belt and all of a sudden your instructors start opening up the, the inner secrets of the art to you and that they that you wish you had had on your black belt test. Um, but one of the things they taught about was fighting with your eyes open. And most of us instinctively, when something's coming at our face, we're gonna close our eyes. Um, and of course in martial arts, that just means you're gonna get hit and not see it. Um, you've got to learn how to um, punch above your weight and how to be get hit with your eyes open. And the better you are at keeping your eyes open, the better you can use your skills and talents to defend or counter or attack, whatever it might be. You can't fight with your eyes closed. So um, punching above your weight gives you opportunities to encounter things that force you to keep your eyes open so that you can learn that muscle as well. We literally had an exercise where I had to stand there in a fighting stance and my instructors would throw punches and kicks right there, millimeter from me. Sometimes they tap you a little bit, but the fact is if you blinked, they would go ahead and hit you because they want to train you to keep your eyes open. And if you moved, they would go ahead and hit you because that wasn't the exercise. So it's an interesting uh, discipline to learn but keeping your eyes open is very important in all of this. So what's this model? Okay, what is it? It's pretty simple. We're gonna move or we need to move. My recommendation, my urging, my behest is that you move to a model that is minimal overhead. Your overhead, the people that you keep on staff, the resources that you keep in house, whether it's people, processes, tools, software platforms, whatever it be, is only what it takes to win, plan, and then retain customers. We don't use overhead to do delivery. We don't do use overhead to, to actually execute the work. Now, that doesn't mean that people on your team are never involved in executing work, but the fact of the matter is if you hire them to execute work, instead of hiring them to help you win, plan and retain business so that somebody else can execute the work that we can hire, you added cost of goods sold, all right? I'll look at, we'll, we'll do some bar charts in just a second. So you need to learn how to run on minimal overhead, which is a different business model. It's a very different mindset. For this to work, you also have to be an expert at forecasting. Many of you tell me you have no idea what's gonna happen. And yes, it's a very weird year. It's very hard to predict because the signals that you're used to seeing aren't there. But let's face it, 
before the pandemic, you were actually pretty good at forecasting. You didn't always trust your forecast. You didn't always listen to what it was telling you. Okay? You didn't always look around the corner. You just said, well, if I can't see it, I don't know. So we're just going to proceed. No, 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 no. The signals were telling you something. So this expertise in forecasting is absolutely critical in business. Um, you don't open a snow cone stand and do a spreadsheet that gives you even revenue year round, right? You know that 90% of your revenue is gonna come in three months. So you may as well shut down for the other nine months, okay? Or maybe you only shut down for seven months. That's up to you. You do the math, you need to be an expert at this. If you don't trust your forecast, you're not gonna make the right decisions. And then we're gonna to have to be experts at procurement. I mean, goodness gracious. Now I've been a huge advocate of outsourcing for a long time. I've helped build a lot of procurement models for folks to help them move to centralized purchasing for labor and sub rentals and equipment, all these sorts of things. We're gonna to have to be even better at it now because in order for this business model to work, one of your overhead, one of your team is gonna be managing the procurement processes that are gonna allow your business to thrive. Now this will affect how you price things because procurement's always the first one to tell you that you sold this below cost, did you know that? Um, so we're gonna to have to price things to be outsourced. We're gonna to have to outsource to keep our overhead low, but you are what you buy. You, bad, you buy bad products, you're, you're not gonna be a good company. You hire cheap labor, you're not gonna be a good company, right? So we have to make all of these things work together. They have to work in sync. So while you're getting your head around that, um, uh, thanks for the com yeah, comment, labor freelance technicians, shortage of freelance technicians in the chat. Yeah, add them as employees, but you seem to say don't do this. No, so let me clear this up right now. It doesn't matter how you pay someone, okay? Whether they're 1099 or W2 doesn't change the fact that you can have a temporary relationship with a human being. Right, so adding them to staff doesn't fix anything unless you add them full time, but you don't need them full time, which is the point. So we do need to look at our freelance market, which right now they've, a lot of them have moved on to other things. We're gonna have to meet their needs, okay? It is a seller's market for freelancers, right? You're gonna have to change the way that you do business. You're gonna have to change your mindset to deal with this. We'll talk about it more, but here's the reason why we have to do all this. Look, here's the old normal. This, this is what I've been doing for the past 15 years. I come into companies that are doing $5 million of revenue and they wanna do $10 million of revenue because we'll make more money. Because growing, right? If you're not growing, you're dying. I've said that, this is true. We wanna grow, we wanna involve, we wanna get better, we wanna make more money. But here's what happens, okay? We start off with the 40% overhead, which is in this, and a $5 million company is $2 million worth of overhead. That's employees, rent, cell phones, tr sales, travel, all those expenses wrapped up in there. But look at this, we have 50% cost of goods sold, which means we have 50% gross profit. We're just killing it. And if we're lucky, they're kicking out 10% net profit on a good year. Um, with uh, depreciation, maybe five or 8%, they're doing 15 to 18% EBITDA. That's as good as anybody did at $5 million. Generally, it wasn't that good. So we had to get them to that version of good first. Now getting up to $10 million, I don't need, theoretically, I shouldn't have to double my overhead, except here's what happens, right? We start conflating capacity with indirect costs and we hire too many people. So when companies move from five to 10 million and they should be seeing economies of scale, they often don't because they're trying to sell the next job. Well, I need another salesperson. Oh, that means I need two more project managers. Oh, that means I need more technicians. Now I need another truck because I might sell something. And as soon as this company hits a lull, hits a drop in revenue, that overhead is intractable. It's very hard to shed. And now they're selling out of desperation. Now they're selling anything they can sell. They're dropping their margins. They're fitting that work in. 
They're a little bit desperate. They're selling from fear. The cost of goods sold goes up because now they're having to outsource and buy things at a, at a worse price than they did before. Um, and they're uh, retaining overhead, trying to sell their way out of the problem so that we can put these people to work. Right? And I've seen this time and time again. There's a better way. And this is the new normal. Okay? This is what I'm advocating for you to find your version of this, where your overhead, look at the overhead that you've been running at this past year. Okay? I, I know that most of my clients and many of the companies I've talked to, um, you know, they went from 50 employees to five or eight employees, maybe less. Okay? They went from $2 million of overhead to $750,000 worth of overhead. And they are doing at least 50% of the revenue they were doing before, maybe more. And many of them are telling me they're actually making more money, even though they're not happy because they're not in the ballroom, the gear's sitting on the shelf. I get all that. But the fact is they're actually making more money and they're seeing more opportunity ahead. Do I rush out and hire all of my people back? Well, the answer is probably no, because to get from 5 million to 10 million in a low overhead model, your overhead might increase as a percentage of revenue, but as a dollar percent, as a dollar, it's not that much. So you can run a $10 million company on a lot less overhead than you were doing it before. However, your cost of goods sold are going to increase. But honestly, who wouldn't want to do more net profit, even if it meant they had a higher cost of goods sold, even if the business was a little bit different? I'm excited about this business. Here's a business I might want to invest in. Can we get that to 20% net profit? What would it take? Can I reduce the overhead more? Are there economies of scale that I'm missing? Okay. Can I leverage my talent pool or my, uh, my supply chain a little bit better and squeeze a couple of points out of there? Now we're running a real business instead of just reacting to the marketplace and trying to anticipate what happens by hiring ahead of demand. It's a very different model. That $10 million company that's making a lot of money turns down a lot of work. The mindset shift here is instead of hiring workers full time to be available if you need them, and which case makes them less expensive, which reduces your job cost, which is a false economy in the old model. Instead, you're gonna focus on having enough work that you can secure seasonal wor workers at fair wages for longer periods of time, rather than on a per job, one gig at a time basis. If you know you're gonna be busy in October and you know you're gonna need freelance staff, you should have already hired them, if not for that gig, for the entire month so that you could have more gigs, temporarily increase your labor force. Is it overhead? Yeah, but it's short-term overhead, right? Your costs are going to be about even because while you're not paying benefits, you are gonna pay a higher wage. So um, these are all part-time workers. Part-time on demand is a normal thing, especially in the US. Uh, most industries have uh, eliminated most um, direct workers who are full-time um, hourly workers, with few exceptions. They're all part-time on-demand workers, right? When I look at these old companies, particularly the ones that were struggling, one of the things I would find, you know, at, at the $5 million company that's only making 2% net profit, it was, I would find a, a nicely staffed warehouse crew who had a guaranteed job Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Plus, they also were the technicians on nights and weekends and any other time. So my, my, overhead, my overtime costs were through the roof. I have highly skilled workers. Oh yeah, I know how you work around this show pay and warehouse pay. That doesn't solve the problem. The fact of the matter is you're paying people to work when you don't need them to work rather than scheduling them. Take that money, hire a better scheduler. If somebody's gonna work Saturday and Sunday, give them Monday and Tuesday off, have somebody else come in and work in the warehouse 
why isn't this common sense in our industry? You know, this is how retail does it, right? You've, have, you, have you ever been in a retail store that was overstaffed? Have you ever been to Home Depot when there were too many employees? No, it doesn't happen. They all staff according to demand and they rotate staffs and, and, and times. We can do the same thing. And the fact that we haven't been doing it means we have a mindset change that we're going to have to power through to get to it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what the organization looks like, because that's usually the next question when I have this conversation with my clients. Well, what's my org chart? This on your screen right now is not an org chart. Okay, This is a roles chart. So bear with me. I know you want to put names in there. I know you're thinking about stuff. So don't do that. Here are the jobs that you need to get done in this low overhead company. Strategy. Strategy is telling us where we need to go and making sure that we keep going in that direction. Okay? That is important. A company without strategy is simply going to wander. So dialing in your strategy, and yes, you do have one, but dialing that strategy in is very, very important. Now, part of that strategy is I'm going to target a specific type of buyer, a specific customer. I need marketing to do that. No, outside sales cannot do marketing. Okay, that one-to-one -one selling is extremely labor intensive. It's a very low ROI. You need to do one-to-many marketing. And it's not just because I wrote a book on it, right? Yeah. It's because it makes more sense. So you need to have some role, whether it's a person or not, is comes later. You need to fulfill the role of marketing. You can't run the business that you're running or that you want to run without marketing. We can't ignore it any longer. Obviously, we're going to need something in the sales role. We need something in the project management role. And I don't care if these are combined roles. We have to fulfill the role. We have an operational role. And we have an admin role, which includes accounting and some other stuff, right? So if I just converted this to people, I, I have a company with five, maybe six people. And I can do just about any kind of work there is. But it all depends on what you then subcontract. Okay. Now I start subcontracting things and I can keep my staff minimal. And there's really, there's absolutely nothing you can, you can't subcontract anymore. You can outsource just about anything. So business development, content creation, um, marketing, um, website development, you can hire project managers, right? You can hire technicians, you can bring in warehouse staff and junior techs, you can sub accounting, I mean, there's so many things that you can do. You just need a process owner back at the mothership to make sure that we're getting what we need out of that supply chain. So that's that's just kind of a business 101 approach to this, right? Now, titles, okay, I'll throw some titles at you because I know it's gonna make you happy. You want the titles, CEO, president, owner, pick the title. I need somebody in charge. Now, they may also do one of these other jobs because most of you are an owner of a company because you were good at something, but you needed employees because you weren't good at everything. Um, so yeah, maybe the CEO is the director of marketing or maybe they're in sales, it doesn't matter. Um, you probably need a director of marketing or a marketing manager or communications manager, pick your title, an account manager, account executive, salesperson, pick your title, some sort of project manager, production manager, pick your title, right? They're fulfilling a role. We need an operations manager, take care of inventory, warehouse, make sure we're hiring the right people, maybe doing some procurement. I've got an office manager who does accounting, um, takes care of a lot of the other administrative and HR things. Um, there we are. Now, I can sub things or I can go to another layer of personnel if it makes economic sense. If it makes economic sense to bring any of those things in house, because I have more than a year's worth of work for them every year, and I'm still going to outsource some part of their job, then it makes sense to bring in. If you're not going to outsource some part of that job, then you don't need that person, right? You can continue to outsource and have less risk and less overhead um, in the long run. So, and then there's some part of our supply chain, which more and more often, is regularly outsourced. And many of you get, are getting used to the idea that you can have part-timers working in your warehouse. And it could be the same part-timer. They can be perfectly well-trained in your system, 
right? But they may be working somebody else's warehouse on another day, working on their system as well. Right? We have a whole gig economy here that can support us if we will let it. And the benefit of this is it's gonna let you grow your business more scalably and take on more work without taking on the obligation of supporting employees that you don't need year round, right? Oh, I know this is a lot of stuff, but when do I hire someone, right? That's the next conversation. When, well, sooner or later, I'm gonna to need to hire some people. Okay, yeah, sooner or later, you probably will. Okay, when are they ready? When is your business ready? You know, do you hire somebody because you can't master the fundamentals and you need somebody else who has the fundamentals to come in and teach and set up the systems? You know, our old rule for hiring pre-pandemic in our job cost world was that we could reduce our job cost and increase our capacity by hiring staff, technical staff, and buying equipment. That would reduce my job cost on events. If I'm in the integration world, I would bring in my own technical crews and hire my own programmers and designers. So I would have all of my costs in-house. That makes my job costs look better. So we're making more money every time we sell. Except you're, you're not making more money when you don't sell. And if they're not attached to a job, they are overhead, right? And you're paying them year round, right? In our new model, we're gonna minimize overhead because we're gonna put a lot more energy into managing our sales funnel so that we have the right business at the right margin and we're turning down better business. And we're gonna manage our supply lines better because that is your core competency. Your core competency is not to hire and retain a team that can do the work. Your core competency is to get the work done. We sell the what. The what is the work is done. How is not what we're selling. We're not selling, I have an entire staff in-house to do this. It's everybody's going to be wearing our shirt and we'll be on our payroll, which adds zero value to the job in real value. It may create a perception, right? but is that perception important to your ideal buyer or is it only important to a certain kind of transactional buyer who's going to squeeze you on price anyway? What do you want more of? Be set up for that. So the elephant in the room in this conversation are, are the workers. who've been at home for over a year, figuring out how to make ends meet. Um, I, I look at Facebook, I look at LinkedIn, I see people going back to work. They finally got rehired after a horrific year and they're very grateful to be back and work again. But more and more I'm hearing from my clients that their old employees and even, even finding candidates for jobs is very difficult. And the candidates are be, becoming very specific about the what they're willing to have a conversation about. Well, I'm, you know, I'm happy to come back to work and I'll work for, full time, but I only work four days a week. I only work from home. I need five weeks of vacation a year. They're not going to give up the things that they found out were important. Like I said at the top of the webinar, okay, people are important. Self-care is important. Cash is important. If they can make their own personal cash go farther and manage their self-care and meet the needs of their families, what do they need you for? If you can't improve their condition, what do they need you for? And our old model of, you know, company store, well, we're a 24-7 industry. I need you available 24-7, 53 weeks out of the year. That's just how we roll. You want to be part of the team or don't you? They don't want to be part of that. And that's probably not going to change. It happened overnight, but it's not going to go back overnight. So if our employee, and who doesn't want an employee who puts their life first, right? Don't we tell them that's important? Don't we say, yeah, you know, we, 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 we put people, family is the most important thing to us. We want you to take care of your family. Here's your health insurance. You know, here's how we'll support you. We're gonna, we'll listen when you're having a hard time. But do we really mean it? Are we willing to change with the way we do business to better meet, meet the needs of the people that we want to work for us? 
Remember, in the labor market, <laughs> that's a seller's market. You're the buyer. You don't have the power you used to have. How do you get that power back? So how do you get the employees to come back? How do you get the workforce to sit up and pay attention? Okay. I can't just raise wages. Though, if you look at the low overhead model, there's probably higher wages involved there. Okay. I need to also look at benefits. I need to work at conditions. I need to look at bonuses and be more liberal about bonuses. I need to find that balancing point for retention and attention. How do I keep their attention? How do I keep them to stay here? What's the magic formula? And oh, it's so complicated because it's not gonna be the same formula for every employee. <sighs> wow, man, you're gonna to have to listen to all of them. Well, good thing you're gonna have fewer employees in this model, so there'll be less for you to keep track of, right? People want work from home options, they want shorter work weeks, they want, um, and you need a flexible workforce. So this is actually working in your favor if you think about it, okay? If you'll quit thinking that it takes one person to fill a seven day job and think that maybe it's two people that fills the seven day job, or maybe I only need one person and a part-timer to fill a seven day job. So start changing how you're thinking about how you're gonna do fulfillment. Rather than saying, I need to have a guaranteed workforce that is stacked up like cordwood in my warehouse, along with my video projectors and microphones. Okay, which is our old way of warehousing employees, hiding them in overhead so that occasionally we could use them as a direct cost. So seasonal options, flexible work schedules. Um, I, have a, I have a client who for years, uh, they have a nine month season and in their summer months, they have no work whatsoever. And so every year they furlough their employees at least probably 70% of their, their, their direct employees get furloughed for the summer. I interviewed a bunch of those employees and they love it that way. It's like being a school teacher. They're good. They want, but they wanted 12 months of pay, not nine months of pay to do it. So we just made that adjustment. Now we have a furloughed workforce that is happy. Okay. It works financially for the business. How can you make all of this benefit you as the employer, as well as benefit the employee? And the trick is never compromise on the benefit to the employee when you're doing these calculations, particularly in the current marketplace. And going forward, that buying power just means that you're gonna have access, even when there is are more employees available and it becomes more of a buyer's market from an employment standpoint, you're gonna have access to a better quality of candidate for less money because you're providing better working conditions and arrangements. All right. Very strategic approach to how we're going to staff. So the implications in all of this, and it's time to start dialing up those questions. Look, the implications is, is that your staff are the team members that you need all year to acquire, plan, and maintain work. And acquiring, planning, and maintaining happens even when you're in the middle of delivery show people. So while you're doing this show, you're still acquiring, planning, and maintaining customers. We, that work can't stop. So I need a team that does that year round. Okay. Now, in this low overhead model, more of your supply chain is gonna replace cost of goods sold. Okay, so those internal costs of goods sold, those people that you kept employed so that you could reduce your job cost are going to be replaced by your supply chain, which you are now going to have to be better at managing, procuring, training, supporting. Okay. That is now mission critical instead of that, oh, by the way, job that you've made it before, or you pass it around, everybody books their own outside labor, or does their own sub rentals. No, 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 no. This is now a key skill set in your operational role on that reduced org chart that I showed you earlier. All right. So great, you know, great things are going to happen through all of this. If we start embracing this, you're not going to flip a switch. You're not going to do it overnight. I get that. I want you to start getting your head around it today. Thank you. Keep the questions coming. And when you're ready to talk about how it might work in your business, because this applies a little bit differently in every single situation, we have some strategy to sort out. 
Okay? I'm ready to start having that conversation with you. Let's do that now while you have the bandwidth and the time to invest in your business so that you can take advantage of everything that 2022 and really Q4 has to offer us this year. Um, now's the time to be having those conversations. So please reach out to do that. So um, post your questions. Let me get rid of this sharing screen because you don't you don't need to look at that screen anymore. And let's see what we've got for some questions here. Um, so uh, Rob asked earlier about bringing back, uh, bringing back or bringing on new sales account reps during this time. Uh, if you look at the roles and how they function in your base overhead model, um, I am generally approving uh, for my clients because they come to me for approval um, um, that they bring in account management so that they can manage more business more carefully, but it's mostly because they're changing the type of customer that they have that needs uh, more care, um, that is less of a transactional buyer, more of a relationship buyer. So yes, absolutely, you need the sales force that's appropriate for your target customer, but more importantly, you need a process that works for that target customer. Because if I'm, if I'm going to use um, account reps for a lot of that process is probably going to reduce a process somewhere else. And we don't want to keep on all the different players for all the different processes because we change our process depending on who the buyer is. That's another reason why we want to focus on a particular buyer because we don't want to maintain the resources for that one-off buyer, that, that occasional buyer um, that might need a different process or a different treatment. Um, so yes, in general, you should be um, looking carefully at your sales channel and see where the process constraints are. And sometimes the process constraint is in the account rep role. Um, but it's probably an extended conversation for any one of your businesses. Um, so... Let me paraphrase here. We need technical ex expertise in order to sell, um, but our technical expertise we haven't brought back yet. Um, same question, is this the right time to bring them back? Is this appropriate overhead? All right, similar answer. Look at your ideal customer. What's the ideal process for onboarding their business, doing the discovery on their projects, to get to the price, to get to the thing that they're willing to agree to so that I can then procure the delivery of it. If technical expertise is critical to that process, it is probably better to have technical expertise in-house because that is a year round job acquiring customers. But if your mindset is, eh, but I also wanna book them on shows, okay, then they're not gonna support the first job which is acquire new business. You're basically hiring a direct cost and trying to pawn them off on your overhead when they're not busy doing shows, which may not be where you need them. Sales needs consistent resources to sell consistently to the consistently correct customer, right? So if I don't, if I need a technical resource to do that, I need a technical resource that is in the sales process to do that. Um, another long discussion and a, a, another thing that I'm answering differently now than I was two years ago. Um, question here is what should we do to keep our current employees, the non laid off ones happy and not have them leave for a better job, new opportunity. Um, I, you know, I just had a coaching call two hours ago and here's the surprising answer. Ask them. They probably don't want to leave. So they're willing to give you the answer. What would make your life better? You know, what's, what's the benefit in lieu of a raise that I can offer you? Um, and you'll be surprised. You'll get a lot of different answers. Um, when we do this in some of the organizations that I'm working with, um, we're finding out some wonderful stuff about one, who our employees are, what they give back to their communities and how we can help, help them do that, which is part of many of your missions is to contribute to your community and your employees are doing it for you and you can support them because they're making it a priority. But we also learned that... Um, a lot of our employees are more productive working from home than they are working in the office. Working in the office is exhausting. I mean, my goodness. Um, you know, coming in and do the 40 hour work week, 
knowing that 75% of your day is going to be extremely non-productive, at least when you're working from home, that 25% can be doing things that are important to you, such as fixing yourself a, a healthy lunch, going for a walk, things that are harder to do when you're working in the office. So ask your employees, how, what will make you happier? Many of them are going to tell you, I need a w reduced workload. Do not reject that out of hand. Listen to what they're saying. Look at your processes. Look how you allocate responsibility. Look at the support systems you have and see if there's something there that you can't fix um, that your old mindset is in the way of. And it's probably your old job cost mentality that's getting in the way of all of this. Uh, another question. Yeah. Um, so John Johnson here made the comment about, you know, high level techs are not willing to commit to blocks of time. They want to pick and choose their gigs. You know what? I used to be a relatively high level tech. I get it. Um, you're going to choose the work that you want to do. I don't need to do the work that you have. Not everybody is looking for a month of work. They're working for quality jobs and they'd rather sit at home than, you know, run house lights in a ballroom. So I like that. I want technicians that can afford to be selective. I want to pay them well. I want to book them way far in advance. But there's also a large part of our gig economy that wants security. Um, somebody somebody tried, was complaining about um, touring right now because right now touring is coming back and they are offering three, six, and nine month guaranteed work for people who didn't really tour before because touring is a hard life. It's a young person's game, but they would rather take that because they need that security and your one or two gigs a month is not enough security for them. So again, just like you have to talk to your employees to find out what's going to keep them happy and how you're going to meet their needs. You need to talk to your suppliers and say, how do you, when do you want me to call you? Okay. How far in advance can it be? And if they're not willing to take an advance booking from you, they are not the problem. You are. Find out why a good freelancer won't take an advance booking from you because they're wanting to take advance bookings from someone else. It's not you and you need to unpack that and understand what's going on there. So good discussion there in the chat. Um, another question, stand by. Um, so this is probably, this is the, well, my, this is more of a comment than a question, but I'll turn it into a question. So my boss just brought back the whole company, you know, all the ones that have been on furlough for a year. Uh, most of them have come back. He says, I have nothing for them to do. So this is a manager saying, what am I supposed to do with all these people? We just had our busy, you know, graduation season. There's not much going on in July. We already cleaned up the warehouse a year ago. Uh, it's still clean. You know, what do I do with these people? And I think it's, you know, sometimes you need to have a heart to heart with your boss. Um, you know, you're, you're hopefully there because your opinion is valued. If you've been working this past year, it means you're very important. It means you're part of that core overhead team that's going to take the company forward. It's time to have a frank conversation and say, you need to look at this overhead model that Tom's talking about and see how it would work here. Um, because I don't have enough work for these people. Can I at least move them to a, a shorter schedule? Oh, no, we don't want to disappoint them after everything that's gone on this year. You know, if the boss is not willing to put the business first to take care of the core employees, you're not taking care of the employees. You're not taking care of anyone. Um, so I, I try and help some people understand that I'm not always successful. But we need to look at that. If you, It's like I was saying a year ago. If you, I know it's hard to lay people off and put people on furlough, but the fact is you need a core group of people to keep the doors open for the business that you're going to have. And the only way to do that is to let the people who you're not gonna have work for go and find something else to do or get on unemployment, whatever it might be. Sometimes we have to do things that are distasteful to take care of the folks that need to be taken care of. Um, Oh, well, we'll have run over time here, but I'm going to ask one more question. Are we almost at a point where we have to make our freelancers part-time employees with the fact that they don't want, they don't want to? So again, how somebody is paid, you know, are they a W-2 or 1099, doesn't matter. Um, a part-time employee 
versus a part-time worker, there's not a lot of distinction in that. So I'm always interested in what the background of this question is and what, how you are using the words when you're asking this. Um, your, your freelancers are technically part-time employees. Um, in my view, they're part of your family. They should be coming to the Christmas dinner. Uh, you, should, you know, it's why are we segregating them in that way if we're hiring an individual? Now, if I'm hiring a supplier, I don't, I don't invite Barco to my Christmas dinner unless they're buying, right? You know, but I might invite, you know, my, my top tier video engineer that I work with all the time. So again, rethink about what's the relationship you want to have with your workforce and what do they want to have from you? And some of them want that arm's length relationship where they're under their own corporation and they're going to give you an invoice and they're, they're an LLC and they've got their own workman's comp. If that's how they want to run their business, treat them like a business. Okay. You may utilize them exactly the same as the individual who's scribbling down an invoice on a piece of paper or typing it in an email, right? Let them meet them where they are. Okay. Um, we all have different views about how we set ourselves up in our businesses. When I was a freelancer, I ran a business. I had, lo I had a logo. I had invoices. We printed things out back before printing things out was not normal. Figure out what that person needs and see if you can't meet them there. So, Folks, as always, um, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. I do appreciate the questions. I appreciate the follow-up emails and calls and the chat. Um, there's so many things that we can do in our new normal to run businesses that will be scalable, profitable, satisfying to everybody who's there. At the end of the day, there's always an owner. There's always a principal stakeholder whose needs we have to meet. Right? And that's where I start. I start with what do you want as an owner? Now, how do we make the rest of that work so that you get what you want and they get what they need? And that's taking a holistic approach to your business. And I look forward to working with more of you on that in this next year. So thanks, everyone. Uh, we will see you next month. And I hope I get to talk to you soon.